is a beautiful morning here, and uh, we're ready to worship together. Would you stand with us as we worship? the world it couldn't fill me man's empty praise the treasures that fade are never enough but then you came along put me back together
God, we thank you that you loved us enough, God, to make the first move. God, thank you so much for your everlasting love, your mercy that is new every morning. God, thank you uh, that you loved us enough to die for us, to call us your children. And so, God, uh, this morning we just want to reflect that praise back to you, God. We want to give you all of our worship. All honor and all praise, it all belongs to you. In your name we pray these things. Amen. You may be seated. actually know about Dave and can see within this church. And so it's a joy to be with you this morning. Uh, a couple of things, we've started to gather, but it's, it's in our living room. And so it started out with our core team, which there's nine of us within our core team, um, but it's slowly growing. And when I say slowly, uh, we could probably have more people than what we currently have right now. But because we're actually taking our time to slowly develop, to make sure that 
We have like-minded people when it comes to mission and what we're seeking to do as far as planting a church goes. We're looking for horsepower, not weight right now, right? And that might sound terrible, but we got to make sure that we're all spiritually aligned and swimming in the same direction because you can get busy doing a lot of things, but it might not be the thing that the Lord has you doing in that particular area at that particular time. I'm very thankful that some of Dave's connections has connected us to very like-minded people, some of which are with us today, and we're very thankful for that. And so they're part of our church family, right? There's no like core and division between them. Like we're family. And so we gather on Sunday mornings and what that looks like is a time of prayer, a time of teaching through the book of Acts right now. We receive communion together. Then we hang out and we enjoy a a real good meal and we celebrate all that Christ is for us and through us in our lives. Tuesday nights, uh, the core team right now, we're just finishing up the last piece of our training before we invite everyone into the next step. We've been going through um, really just what, let's call it spiritual alignment of what we're seeking to do and what we feel God has called us to do in Greensburg. And we take that evening and we Everything's wrapped around food, by the way. It's wrapped around Christ, wrapped around the gospel, wrapped around food. And so we eat and and we fellowship and we enjoy one another and we specifically pray because we actually know that nothing can happen apart from Christ doing it. You you can get busy doing a lot of things. You can do a lot of things that that some people might look at and applaud, but, but we're not looking for the praise of man. We're looking for Jesus to be exalted and praised in the community of Greensburg and surrounding areas. And so that takes a miracle. The fact that you woke up today trusting and believing in Jesus Christ is a, is a miracle. You and I would not love Jesus apart from the Holy Spirit working to continue to keep us in that place. And so we need, we need mega grace to do this thing. And, um, and he's supplying it. So, so we have seen our, our little team grow to like 14 people right now. And, and many, uh, the, the few people that we've added, it was because of Dave's connection. Uh, people that he was connected with through youth ministry. And, and what's been amazing is they're from Greensburg. And, and, and it advanced everything very quickly. Because in order to get to know a community, you, you need a friend within that community that will kind of give a thumbs up. And so we have a few of those friends, and they're excited about what God's called us to. And really, what we want to do is just see them grow in their discipleship of the Lord because they have a much greater pathway of reaching the people in those communities. So we're, we're hoping that they'll continue to connect us to people that we might be able to minister to as we encourage them to continue to reach their neighbors. So that's a couple of things. That the, the, the other thing is God has been very kind to connect us to other churches and in, even individuals who are, are really supporting us. Because what we want is partnerships, right? Lots of people can write a check. Not everybody does, but people can do that. But we want actual partnerships, people who, who are praying for us, who are, are checking in on us. And, and Dave has been that for us. And so I'm thankful. And, and because Dave's been that for us, you've been that for us. And so I just want to give thanks to God for you and for our opportunity to be together today. Keep us in prayer. We've got a lot of work to do, but we're excited about the labor that he has. I I can tell you I've been in pastoral ministries on staff for uh, eight years, not on staff, collectively 12. And probably within this last two, three months, I've probably had more gospel conversations than I've had in the last two years. And you might think, well, that's strange. Weren't you pastoring? I was, but I was talking to, I was sharing the gospel with believers. I'm talking specifically those who are not convinced of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I, I'm finding the temperature right now where we're at, people are more open than ever before. And so they're considering the weight of the gospel. And um, so pray, pray that eyes would be open to believe and to see the light of the gospel, that people would be born again, and that literally lives would be transformed. And as that happens, like cities are transformed, families are transformed, and, and whole trajectories of people's legacies can be changed in an instant. And that's what happened to me at the age of 23, not growing up in a Christian home. Jesus rescued me, and in rescuing me, he's rescued and redeemed so many pieces of my life, and I just want more people to know of his saving grace. So please pray for that. Pray that our church core, body, um, would just... Man, that they would love Christ way more than they do right now. And I think they love him well. But, but we need to grow in our love for Christ because it's from the overflow of that that everything's going to change. And um, so 
With that being said, let's, let's go ahead and get in the Word. Dave, I need help, okay? It's 10 o'clock. You need to give me like a 5, 10 minute. I know. You're like, can't you figure this out? No. And um, just give me a little bit of a, a wink or a, a thumbs up like when it's time to land the plane, right? Um, so with that being said, go ahead and open your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Uh, we're going to start in verse 9, and we're going to work our way through verse 12. And, uh, and so I just want to take a moment to pray. Uh, for our time in the Word. So we join me in prayer. Father, we thank you um, for this day that you have set aside for us to gather corporately, to sit under the Word of God. Lord, um, I'm not the one with authority. Your Word is authoritative. You are the chief shepherd. And so, Lord, we need you. We need grace. I pray that as the Word goes out, Lord, that, that it is working in the hearts and the minds of those who know you to know more deeply and more fully how much you truly love them. Lord, that you would unfold and reveal the manifold wisdom of God to know the gospel into the depths of our heart because that's where real change and real transformation happens. For anyone who is gathered today that might not be convinced of the gospel and of your love, Lord, I pray that you would do that saving work uh, today, that today would be the day of salvation, that you would give the gift of repentance and faith, that they would come home, that they would receive real life that can only be found in Jesus Christ. And so as your word goes out, we trust that you are doing a great work because you're a good God who is sovereign and all-powerful. And so we ask these things in the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. All right, so throughout this letter of uh, 1 Thessalonians, Paul has been He's been teaching how to live in light of, of the gospel in, in, in a particular way that, of Jesus' return, right? And so I'm not going to cover a lot of that. I'm trusting that Dave's doing that. But we're picking it up right after a pretty sober warning uh, that, that Paul had given the church. He, he said, listen, this is the will of God for your life. Everyone's always like, what's the will of God for my life? Paul tells you, if you pay attention in 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, he says it's your sanctification, It's that you would be more like Jesus. That's his desire for you. In every area of life, that you'd be more like Christ. And then he he actually goes into, um, particularly with sexual integrity, in, in a very immoral world. Okay, so that's where we're coming out. But the same thread is continuing. So he's continuing that thought of sanctification within this people. And today he continues to encourage the church to live with gospel intentionality. Right? To to live all of life through the lens of the gospel. That that the gospel isn't just the the news that, that saves us. Although it is. It's the same good news that sustains us, that transforms us, that makes us more and more like Christ. And it affects everything. And when it doesn't, there's something, there's something off in your discipleship. And so he's going to address that. So let's look at the Word of God, 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 through 12. You can follow along as I read. Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more and to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent upon no one. I thought, man, if I had to summarize that in one sentence, you might be able to do this better. This is my summary of it. Essentially, he's saying, I want you to love loud. I want you to live quietly so that some might hear. That's that's what he's saying. He says, listen, you're loving. You're loving well. People are hearing about it. All the brothers throughout the region of Macedonia, they have heard of this great love, but I want you to do that more, and I want you to do that more. So crank up the volume on love But I want you to think about how you're living outside of the church family, and you need to dial back some pieces to live peaceably with one another so that those who are not convinced of the gospel might see the way you're walking, see the way you're living, and have to wrestle with the fact that these people are wildly different than the folks I knew a year or two years ago. Right? That's what he's asking them. So the first point is that the gospel compels us to love more and more. So that's the first point. I don't think it's it's profound, but we have to continue to look at the basics, right? So the gospel of Jesus Christ compels us to love more and more. 
Paul gave the church a huge encouragement in this text. He, he loves all the churches, but he's, he's excited about what he sees within this church body. He, he acknowledges, listen, you don't even need anyone to teach you. God's taught you to love, and, and you just got to keep doing that. You got to keep doing that more and more. So much that he says this staggering statement. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. This, no doubt, through the Old Testament, through the Apostle Paul, teaching the Bible to them, the gift of the Holy Spirit who's working in them, living and active. They've been taught by God. That's a stunning thing, man. It would be amazing if, if, if the Apostle Paul, that'd be strange, but if he came here and he said, Bridge, I just want you to know, man, like your love, it's wildly famous all throughout the region of Ohio. It's getting into West Virginia and in Western PA. Steeler fans can't even imagine that this thing's happening here. Well, that'd be... I think you, I would hope you'd be excited about that. Like, if, if God is going to grade us on anything, it's going to be on how we love. Jesus says, you will know my disciples by how they love one another. And Paul is saying, you're doing that. You're doing it. Good job. Now do it more and more. Don't quit. Don't rest on that. Continue to love. So he compliments the church. And, and it's an amazing thing if you think about where this church would have come from. They're lost. They're not worshiping the one true God. And their lives have been truly transformed. The same has happened to you if you sit here as, as a saved man or woman in Christ. Our nature is not to love. It is, in one sense, our nature is to love ourselves. That's our natural bent. We love ourselves really well. Right? Other people, probably not so much. I mean, for the simple fact that you and I, we're born rebels, who, who naturally love ourselves. You never have to teach a child to love themselves. They do that. And they do that really well. You have to actually teach them to be considerate of other people and need God's grace and help to do that. Um, here's the thing, though. In our culture, the word love, it, it's so distorted and so strange because we use the word love for everything. Like, I will even do that. I say, I love bacon. Anybody who hangs out with me for any period of time, you're going to know that I love bacon. Okay, and, and it's easily loved. I love football. I love coffee. I love coffee specifically from the common place, which is a great little place in Indiana, Pennsylvania. That's a real thing. Um, and actually, it's the original, right? The state of Indiana came after the, the town of Indiana. I know we have some friends from the state of Indiana. And so you get all the, the street cred, though. And, um, but to say that, like, love, when we do this, the culture fails to understand a proper meaning of love. And because of that, we can have a misunderstanding of what that even means when we say that we love one another. And, and the gospel transforms that thinking, right? Um, we live in a world, if you just pay attention, it's everywhere. It's in the movies. It's in the songs. It's all over the culture. Love, 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 love. So much so that millions seek it. Many never find it because they don't even know what real love is. And that's a, that's a, that's a problem, right? Uh, the 90s, that's probably the generation I most resonate with in music, right? It's generally within your, uh, your you know, formative years or even, let's say, like in your high school years, 9th, 10th, 11th grade. So I just started bringing up some 90s songs that talk about love, right? Here's, here's just a few. And if you're in that era, you might remember. So 1990, Keith Sweat, right? He says, I'll give all my love to you, right? 91, Pearl Jam, my favorite band, he, they wrote a song called State of Love and Trust, not really so, though. The Eagles, right? They were still singing in 94, and they wrote a song called Love Will Keep Us Alive. Well, it will, but you got to make sure you got the right one. Mariah Carey, right? Endless Love. LL Cool J, my man, right? Hey, Lover. He's talking about something else. The Magnetic Fields wrote a, a, book, a song called The Book of Love, and they're not talking about the Bible. So I think we can agree that everyone's interested in love. But because everyone's confused on it, and many have no clue what it is, we have to go to the foundation of what is love. And what's love got to do with it? Different generation than the 90s. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I found the generation. And uh, I like that, but it was very good. So the Bible cuts through it, though. The Bible just cuts through it. It tells us what love is. We don't have to guess. We can know what real love genuine, authentic love is. So let's look. 1 John 3.16 says this, by this we know love. Okay, that's good. That's good. By this we know love. What? 
that he, Jesus, laid down his life for us and that we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Do you see that? So what is love? It's Christ on a cross dying for sinners so that sinners can receive forgiveness and can receive righteousness and enjoy life and real love in the presence of Almighty God forever. And that love then ought to compel us to love the family. Right? It's very clear. And isn't, I'm so thankful we don't have to guess because the whole Bible is one redemptive love story. It's what it is. I've had people say this. You may have said this. I'm, I'm not really picking on it because I can see and understand why someone would say it. But they'll say the Bible, the B-I-L-B-L-E, right? It's basic instructions before leaving earth. I don't know about you, but, man, I never want to read an instruction manual. I just figure it out. And we do that with the Bible. But the Bible is, there is instruction in there, and that's good. But it's so much more than that. Oh my goodness, don't, don't boil it down to that because that's a great way to get no one excited about the Bible. The fact is, it's, it's God revealing his beautiful love, redemptive plan, his holiness, our sinfulness, and, and how he's created us to know him, to love him, to enjoy him, and that there's no life found outside of him and a way to have life with him through the person and work of Christ. And so we can know real love because real love came down and revealed himself to us. That's amazing, because every other religion is about you and I working our way and evolving our way towards God, and it's a bankrupt plan. It never works. We need revelation, not evolution. We, we can't get to God. God came to us. He showed us what love was when, when he, while we were weak, ungodly sinners, willingly went to the cross. Not because we were lovable, but in order to make us lovable. And so those who know this love, now we get to be agents of that love. This church is doing that. I hope and trust that you're doing that. Now do that more and more. Can you see that? That's, that's so good that he's encouraging that. And, and so I want to look at one other text here. We're going to look at more, but before we move on to point two. It says, we love, this is 1 John 4, 19 through 21. Because he's, he's telling them to love and he's telling them to do it more and more. He says, but, but make sure you don't get the cart before the horse. He says, we love, why? Because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and he hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. And so, so here's the deal. God is at work within us to create that kind of love. And, 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 and here's the thing. The gospel is on display when we do that. And so I would say this, that if, that if you're here and, and you're struggling, we all struggle to love one another. Can, can we just agree to that? It, it's a fight. It, it's a battle at times. Some are extra grace needed, right? Like you just know this person needs so much grace in order for me to love them. But some people might be easy to love. But, but Jesus is telling us not only to love one another. In the context, it's a brotherly love. It's within the church. But he tells us to love our enemy. Well, that's radical. That's radical. And many people will say, well, I love God, but I have no time for that person. And if, and if that's you, I want you to know that's not biblical Christianity. It's just not. We, sanctification is about love. It's about love. So you can't say I love God this much, but I love people this much. You just can't. Something's wrong. Chances are you only understand God's love this much. That's why you love this much. See, as we grow in our understanding and love for God, our capacity to love grows equally in proportion. So if you have a love problem, let's say this way, it's a love problem this way. You've not understood how much he loves you. And the answer to your love problem is not to try harder. It's to rest in the fact that he loves you. And therefore, I don't need anything from you. Therefore, I can love you. Why? Because I got my love here. I don't need you to reciprocate. This church gets that. That's amazing. May we get that more deeply than we actually understand it right now in this moment. So then the second thing that we see, though, so this is point number two, is that the gospel transforms us to, to rest and labor faithfully. And I think, I think if you look, you see that. Look at 11 and 12 again within our original text today, 1 Thessalonians 4, 9, 10, 11, 12. He says, but we urge you, 
All right? So love more and more, but we urge you, brothers, to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we instructed you. Why? So that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent upon no one. Now, if you've been walking with the Lord for any time, you'll know that there's not one part of your life that Jesus will leave undone. He's coming in and he's bringing about change in every area of every aspect of your life. The gospel creates an entire new way of life and a new way of living and and literally changes everything about us, right? You are a new creation and you have a new Lord and you submit to him and you're going to become like him. So Paul urges the church to aspire to live quietly. Three things, live quietly, mind your own affairs, work with your hands. See that? And this is an overflow of love. If you want to love more and more, these are things you need to do. You need to get your household in order. You need to care for the things that are within your sphere of influence. Why? So that you can give more than you actually receive. But to do that, you've got to be able to trust and receive from the Lord and care for the home. Right? And so what's it mean to aspire to live quietly? The the translation of the word quiet here, actually it's better if we don't think of quiet as in not talking, which I'm like, amen, thank you, Lord. It's, it's more restfulness. It's much more restfulness would be a better understanding as opposed to quiet, you know, to talkativeness. Um, because we have peace with God, believers ought to lead a restful life. But man, I, I got to admit, like within our culture, it's like mission impossible, in my own life. There's times where I don't feel at rest. I might have an internal rest and these things, but I'm running here and there. And and this is the fishbowl we're swimming in, right? Everywhere you look. Now, now COVID certainly interrupted some of those rhythms, and there's some blessings to be had there if we'll hear, if we'll learn, if we'll grow. But as things start to open up, we might just get back on the freeway and and hit the gas. I would really recommend that you think about what the Lord's trying to teach us in this moment. I'm not your Holy Spirit. You have him. You ought to seek him in this moment. And how are you going to change coming out of it? Because I think there's a lot to learn. But if you'll just listen to the conversations that happen all around you, think about it. How are you? Man, I'm crazy busy. It's crazy. You have no clue. It's just nuts. Oh, okay. How's work? Really nuts. Super busy, right? How are the kids? Their lives are so busy. I don't even know if I'm coming or going. I'm running Johnny here and I'm running Susie there. I, I just can't stop. I feel like, you know, all I do is run, 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 run. And, you know, a neighbor might ask you, hey, can, can you help me with something? Hey, man, I'd love to, but I'm busy. Or you say, yeah, I actually could help you. But then in saying yes to your neighbor, you just said no to your family. And, and this is the lives that we live. And that's communicating something. But gospel people ought to to have a different pace about their life. It's so good to know you can go to bed because God doesn't. It's so good to know that I can lay my head on the pillow of God's sovereignty and know that he's working this thing out. And I don't have to wear myself out because I'm not God. And when I try to be, I wreck everything around me. I make a horrible God. I'm guessing the same is true for you. Here's the problem, though. This comes into the church. Many confuse busyness with fruitfulness. We think the more we accomplish, the more we do, that the, the, man, we're just, we're just killing it. Look at my stats. If I had a football card, you'd be amazed. I got touchdowns left and right. But, but here's the problem. Some of that might be good. Some of that just might be feeding an identity that you just need to just kill. And remind yourself, man, I, I am God's son by grace. Therefore, he said it's finished. That doesn't mean I don't do anything, but what it does mean is I work from that as an identity. I don't need you to approve and to love. So that brings about peace. That brings about rest. The other thing he says, though, is to mind your own affairs. Maybe a better, newer translation might say, mind your own business or handle your business. Um, Take care of your family. And, And by the way, that does not mean it's easy. Oh, it's not easy. Can I get an amen on that? All right, I heard that, sister. Right? Like, it's not easy. It's hard work. Right? If you're going to have a a, a good-looking garden, and I don't. I mean, I tried that thing. It's easier for me to just go to the the little stand and buy the thing from the guy with the green thumb or the gal with the green thumb. But but here's the deal. Like, if you're going to do that, you got to labor. 
You got to pull weeds. You got to you got to check the nutrients. You got to see if it's got enough water. If you want to have a fruitful garden, man, if it's hard to grow fruit there, it's even more impossible within the family. It takes effort. It takes prayer. It takes tons of grace. I've seen families who love the Lord Jesus and did everything, you know, quote unquote, really well, and it doesn't turn out well. And I've seen families that just make a wreck of things and their kids love Jesus. It's all grace, but we have to labor. It's grace driven effort. So he says to mind your own affairs. It doesn't mean though, that if your neighbor's hurting that you're like, sorry, bro, I'm just living my peaceful life. You know, I'm just minding my own affairs. No, it's not passivity that's sinful. But it is saying, I got to care for my family before I can care for others. That's what it's saying. And, and then he says to work with your hands. And actually, this is a big theme within 1 Thessalonians and goes into 2 Thessalonians. So they're gonna, this is going to get hit again. There's reasons that he's encouraging this. A lot of people are not working in that church. And it's, it's not looking good on King Jesus. right? They're like, he's coming back, bro. I just quit my job, got my check. And uh, can I borrow a couple bucks until that thing happens? But you know it's happening. And he said, no, no. Get to work. Labor. And... and and so, like, if you're not working and you're able to work and, and you, you're hurting for money and different things, but you're able, I mean, work. Work, right? I, that's the end of that. Like, I don't need to say anymore. Like, just work. And, and, and work in a way that, that makes your job not your God, but that is under submission. Because I think that if, if, if Paul were to talk to a lot within the American church, he doesn't always necessarily need to tell people to work. He needs to say that your work's not your God. And so you're going to fall somewhere within that. But we want to work in a way that makes Jesus look great. We want to work in a way that brings him glory. We don't want to work in a way where everybody just says how amazing you are because you got this and you got that. Like we work in order. I mean, we were created to work. Right? It's not because of the fall that you and I have to work. It's because of the fall that it's hard, but it's a joy to work. It's a good thing to work. So he's saying to do that, to live an industrious life, to work hard, to support yourself. Why? So that you cannot be a burden on the community and so that you can be generous, right? So when, when we're transformed by the gospel, you and I will give more than we take. Now, you might be here, and you actually need, in this moment, to take more than you give. I want you to know that's okay. Why? Because hopefully you have enough people around you that that's not their situation, and they want to help you. But the goal is to see the Lord get you to a point where you're able to start giving. And it might never be a big financial piece, but I'm going to give you my time. I'm going to give you presents. I'm going to be here for you. I'm going to have a coffee. I'm going to sit down, and I'm going to give my undivided attention and love to you, right? And so we want to be a people who, who are able to love more and love more, and the only way to do that is to make sure that we got these things in order, and we need grace to do that. We need much help to do that, and we need one another to do that. We need each other in the body. So if you have someone in the body who wants to work and they don't know, you might have a friend or a family member here who can help you. But then go and represent Jesus well and represent your friend well so that you can start to get your feet underneath you, right? The, the main point here, there is to be no sacred or secular divide in the life of a Christian. Everything is sacred. I think many times we just we make this mistake of thinking that that my life with Jesus he is here is here on Sunday morning, maybe at a, at a at a group where we gather on a Wednesday night or whatever night you might meet, and and if those streams ever flood back in, I'll just get my Jesus on. And how are you, bro? I'm good, man. Me and Jesus, we're tight, right? Like we're just awesome. But then you know it's not true. If that's where you're at, man, I would just recommend. That, that you, you find someone you can trust and you be honest because all of life is sacred. Everything you do is sacred. If, if you're a mom who has you know, a child, I hear, I hear kids in the, in the basement, right, playing, laughing, that's a good sign, and they're in diapers, you got to figure out how to change that little one's diaper to the glory of God. Because the apostle, the apostle Paul, listen, he said in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whatever you do, whether you eat, whether you drink, whatever you do, do it in a way that makes King Jesus look spectacular. 
that makes him look stunningly amazing. And so do we approach our lives like that in every aspect? Because if we don't, then that's an area of sanctification that needs to grow. Because it's about making him great. We don't make him great. He is great. But we want our lives to reflect in such a way that people say, what's up with you people? Man, I've met the risen Christ. And he's changed me. And I don't live for your approval. You might not say this in the first conversation. And I don't live for my job. And I don't even live for the fact that I'm a, a dad. Because eventually, they're going to move out of the house. And if your whole life was built on that identity, you're going to be crushed. I am a father. I'm thankful to be a father. And, but, but I am a son of the father. And my job is to raise this child the best I can to love. But that needs a miracle. That needs a miracle. And I can't do that. But I'm going to put as much kindling around that heart and pray that the Lord would set it ablaze. That's my job. And I'm going to do that. And your kids aren't always going to approve of that. Your neighbors might not always approve of that, which is why we need to submit ourselves gladly, joyfully, under the one who rules and reigns. And say, God, help me. God, help me. Because everything feels like it's warring against me. But I want to love. Because see, when war is happening, and, and I'm talking within your neighborhood, within your home, everywhere you go, everything's difficult. The first thing that's easy to go is love. You just get real hardened. No, it's not worth it. My heart's grown cold, but Paul is saying, no, you're loving well. Love in these areas. Continue to love more and more. To do this, you and I, essentially, he's calling us to not live a self-focused life but to live a gospel-focused life, right? And I think we throw that word around like just cheap change, yeah, gospel-focused, right? But what does it even mean? It means that I'm focusing on the fact that Christ has accomplished everything and I'm a receiver. I'm needy. I'm dependent. I go to him every day and I remind myself, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me in the life that I now lead. I live, I, I live in the one who loved me and gave himself for me. So God, work in me, work through me. I need you. I'm a receiver, right? He's the vine. We're the branches. And when we try to do it in our power, it's exhausting. I know because I've been exhausted in my life many times where I'm trying to do this thing. But if we're going to love the way that Christ is calling us to love, the way that Paul's calling us to love, you and I, my friends, cannot do it. We need him. We need his power. The life of a Christian is to be one of power, Holy Spirit power. We have a real helper. It's good to know that the living God is living inside of you if you are trusting in Jesus for your salvation. So you're not alone. Even on a day that you might feel it, you're not. We need truth, and the truth is, is that we have him. We have been blessed to be a blessing. That's the point of the text. It's the point of the Bible. Right? Genesis 12. I'm going to bless you so that you'll be a blessing to the nations. The church is to be a blessing, yes, to one another, but it's to spill out within our neighborhoods, right? And that's all. It's a very simple text that he's talking about. The third and, and final point is that the gospel is made visible by how we love and by how we live. It's made visible. Now, I have to be careful because the gospel is words, it's words, right? So you can be the kindest, most happy, slappy person ever, and no one's going to get saved unless you share the good news of Jesus Christ, period. And that they respond in faith, and you can't do that. We are entrusted to be ambassadors who, who live in a particular way that looks as different than the world and share the good news of the gospel, okay? So the gospel is words. It, it's, it's good news that Christ died for sinners, right? And that you can have life with God by trusting in him and nothing else. It's by grace alone, through faith in Jesus Christ alone. And, and you and I can do nothing except receive what he has done. You receive the gift. That, okay? Just to be clear. But those who, yeah, okay. Whoa. Okay. Um, those who receive this good news, okay? 
The way we live transforms inside out and is known to all who see. Okay? So that, that last point is this. The gospel is made visible by how we live and how we love. I want to read one quick quote. And then I'm going to land this plane in five minutes. Okay. Um, coming out of the book of Acts, there was a man who was tasked to try to figure out why this whole Christianity movement was getting so much traction. And I want to read what he wrote. So he said this he's about the early church. He said, further, if one or other of them have bondmen or bondwoman or child through love towards them, the church will persuade them to become Christians. And when they have done so, they will call them brethren or brother without distinction. They do not worship strange gods. And they go on their way in all modesty and cheerfulness. Falsehood is not found among them, and they love one another. And from widows they do not turn away their esteem, and they deliver the orphan from him who treats him harshly. And he who has gives to him who has not without boasting. And when they see a stranger, they take him in their home. They rejoice over him as a very brother, for they do not call them brethren after the flesh, but brethren after the spirit and in God. And whatever one of the poor passes from this world, each one of them, according to their own ability, gives heed to him and carefully sees to his burial. And if they hear that one of their number is in prison or afflicted on account of the name of their Messiah, all of them will anxiously minister to his necessities and, if possible, redeem him and set him free. And if there is among them any that is poor and needy, and if they have no spare food, they fast two or three days in order to support apply to the needy what they are lacking for food. How, how did the gospel spread throughout? I can give you lots of theological reasons, but it's love. It's love. It's profound love that is real love, not what the world talks about love. It is counting others more significant than I actually count myself. Right? It's, it's going without so that someone might have. When the gospel captures your heart, when the gospel captures your mind, you and I will join God on mission in what he's doing. We will delight in Jesus instead of ourselves. We will get to know, love, and serve our neighbors. We will work hard to right what has been twisted through sin and through all the brokenness within the world. And we will gladly share the gospel and our lives with those who come in contact with us because apart from Christ, you and I can never have life. That's what we will do. That's what happens within the body of Christ. And we can't do it apart from him. Oh, so God help us. We need much help to continue to love more and more. And so I'm going to pray, and uh, I'm going to ask that the Holy Spirit would help us to love in that fashion. Will you join me in prayer? Father, it, there may be people sitting here right
and teach my heart with all your wisdom to live forever. Teach my heart, oh my God, forever you reign here and now. Hear the sound of your us to look outwardly and to love others the way that you would have us. God, um, we praise you this morning. We just pray that you would continue to rub these things into our hearts, uh, that we might live these things out outside of these doors. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Guys, have a blessed week. You're dismissed. Be sent. <laughs>